walking into the building this morning, I realized my hands were empty. I immediately recognized that my hands should not be empty. My hands should have a sermon in them. <laughs> Fortunately, the sermon was in the back seat of the, on the back seat of the car, so uh, we're good, good to go. Well, from 1970 to 1991, <clears throat> I was associated in one way or another with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, first as a congregant and then as a pastor. And uh, during that time, uh, during that time, um, I often heard the story about the denomination's founding, the story about Albert Benjamin Simpson and the founding of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Simpson was called to be the pastor of 13th Street Presbyterian Church in New York City in 1879. Biographies of Simpson described the congregation as prestigious and fashionable. Well, as Simpson moved into his new place of ministry, he quickly recognized the thousands of immigrants that then flooded the city of New York. He wondered what was being done to minister to the needs of these people and found that very little was being done. Indeed, there was a lot of animosity toward immigrants in 1879. Things don't change. Well, Simpson thought something should be done. And so he started ministering to these immigrants around the uh, location uh, of, the, of the church. He sought to bring them into the church community. But he was quickly told, no, you can't do that. You can't bring the poor and the dirty, the sick, into our congregation. It reached the point where Simpson had to make a decision, either minister to 13th Street Presbyterian Church or minister to the immigrants. He chose the latter. And out of that came the founding of a church, the Gospel Tabernacle, and from that then the, de the denomination the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Simpson crossed a boundary. I don't know, um, I don't know if, uh, sorry, what I'm seeing isn't what you're seeing, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Simpson crossed the boundary. I don't know if he knew the boundary existed before he crossed it, but when he crossed it, he knew it was there. He knew he crossed it. He didn't retreat. God's call was to engage, to build relationships, and through those relationships, introduce people to Jesus Christ. That is what he did. We encounter boundaries every day. Many of those boundaries should not be crossed legal boundaries, moral boundaries, professional boundaries, interpersonal boundaries, they are fixed. However, in the course of a day, we encounter other boundaries that Jesus crossed and that he invites us to cross. These are boundaries originating in prejudice, nationalism, pride, ideology, wealth, comfort, anger, self-interest, the list probably could go on. They are boundaries that stand between ourselves and the people Jesus calls us to engage. They are boundaries of our creation that stand between us and people who don't look like us, talk like us, or live like us. Five to ten years after Jesus' ascension, Jesus' earliest followers found themselves 
crashing into, tripping over, and sometimes providentially crossing an intimidating boundary. It was the boundary between themselves, Jews who followed Jesus Christ, and Gentiles. Jews did not trust, really did not like Gentiles. Gentiles were the enemy. Jewish law prohibited Jews from having any social act, uh, uh, interaction with Gentiles. If they invited a Gentile into their home, their house was unclean. If they entered a Gentile's home, they were unclean. To share a meal with a Gentile was unthinkable. However, Jesus' instructions were clear. He said to make disciples of all nations. He didn't mean Jews in all nations. He meant everyone, Jew and Gentile, in all nations. In Acts 11:19, Luke resumes a narrative he interrupted at the end of Acts 8:3. If we would remove Acts 8:4 through 11:18, which I'm not suggesting we do, we would find Acts 11:19 neatly follows Acts 3. In Acts 11.19, Luke resumes his description of the Christian community's flight from Jerusalem to escape the persecution that followed Stephen's death. Previously, Luke told Stephen's story. Stephen was a Jesus follower. God worked miracles through him. Jews opposed him. They accused him of offending God. They tried him, found him guilty, and stoned him to death. Persecution of the Christian community immediately followed, leading everyone except the apostles and a handful of others to flee the city. As these followers fled, they fulfilled the task Jesus entrusted to them. They proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. However, Luke points out they only spoke to Jews. Now, Willie James Jennings is probably correct. The Jewish community who limited their witness to the Jewish community probably didn't do anything, in his words, evil or immoral. Jesus doesn't prohibit witness to Jews. Jesus wants his followers to proclaim the good news to all persons, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, ideology, theology, whatever. However, that Luke specifies they spread the word only among Jews is curious, especially in light of the comparison that follows. Were there not any Gentiles along the way who might welcome a conversation about Jesus Christ? Luke contrasts these folks with another group of Jewish Christians. The second group of Jewish Christians consists of, of Jewish Christians from Cyprus and Cyrene who traveled to Antioch. Although they flee the Jewish persecution, they go to Antioch on a mission. Verse 20, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Also is a key word. The visitors to Antioch do not ignore the Jews. However, significantly, they also proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ to Gentiles. The good news about Jesus Christ is a message for all, a prominent theme throughout Acts. 
What these men did is significant. As they arrive in Antioch and work to introduce Gentiles to Jesus Christ, they cross the cultural, social, and political boundary that separated them as Jews from Gentiles. They ignored what tradition taught them to do. They may have even ignored their natural inclination to separate from these Gentile people. They did what Jesus called them to do. They did what was right. They crossed the cultural, social, and political boundary that lay between them and the Greeks. In Luke 11.21, Luke reports, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. God was with the men. God empowered the men to do what he called them to do. As a result, people paid attention. People surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. A congregation of Jesus followers was formed in the city. Yes, some of these people were likely Jews, but we know from Acts 15 that a number of them were Gentiles. Can we trust God to enable us to cross the cultural, social, and political boundary that might separate us from someone? Can we trust God to lead us across that boundary and enable us to introduce that person to Jesus Christ? From, from whom might we be separated? Who might God be inviting us to engage? Eventually, news of a Christian community in Antioch reached Jerusalem. We don't have record of formal communication from Antioch to Jerusalem. The men of Cyprus and Cyrene might have sent a formal report to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. We don't know. It might be that the apostles and elders in Jerusalem simply learned about what was happening in Antioch through the grapevine. Regardless of communication, how the communication occurred, leadership in Jerusalem learned that Gentiles in Antioch were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Previously, when the leaders of the church of Jerusalem heard about a similar development in Samaria, they sent Peter and John to inspect the situation. They wanted to know what was going on. The apostles and elders follow the same strategy upon receiving news about the situation in Antioch, although on this occasion they send only a single representative. The person chosen to represent Jerusalem at Antioch was Joseph, who earned the nickname Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement. He was a Jewish Christian, a Levite, originally from Cyprus. He appears to have been a man of some financial means, for we later read about him selling a piece of property and donating the proceeds to the apostles. He apparently remained with the apostles in Jerusalem during the persecution. Luke identifies him as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Barnabas is the only person in Acts Luke identifies as good. Good is a word that was not used loosely in the first century. It was used of persons who were truly good. Barnabas' character set him apart 
from the majority. Now Luke doesn't specify the purpose of Barnabas' visit to Antioch, but the larger context of Acts suggests the apostles and elders sent Barnabas on a fact-finding mission. They wanted to know what the men from Cyprus and Cyrene were doing. Gentiles are surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ? Really? That possibility still had not thoroughly sunk in among the Jewish Christians who dominated the Christian community at the time. In Acts 11.23, we read, When he, that is Barnabas, arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas saw evidence of God at work in and through Jesus' followers. Further, he saw evidence of God's work in the lives of those people, those Gentiles in particular, who claimed to have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Barnabas determined the reports were true. The testimonies were genuine. Even though the men from Cyrene and Cyprus appear to undertake their project independent of the apostles, even though they do not have an apostolic chaperone on site to guide them, Barnabas determines the work is good. God is at work in this place. God is at work among the Gentiles. Barnabas, though, did not simply look and go home. He encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Daryl Bach rightly prefers the wording of the New, Interna or New English translation, which reads, to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. Although Barnabas's assignment may have been simply to investigate the Antioch congregation, he did not stop when he fulfilled the task. He saw a need, he saw an opportunity, and he stepped into it. Now remember, he is a Jewish Christian. He encountered the same cultural, social, and political boundary that the men from Cyrene and Cyprus encountered when they came to Antioch. Nevertheless, Barnabas steps across that boundary. True to his nickname, Barnabas encouraged the Christian community. He encouraged them to persevere in their commitment to Jesus Christ. What happens in Antioch is the living out of theology. Yes, theology is something that can be lived. And here we see an example of it. Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection breaks down what Paul will later identify as the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. These people are no longer Jew and Gentile. They are not even Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. What Jesus does on the cross and in the resurrection erases that distinction. What Jesus does in transforming their lives through the work of the Holy Spirit is to transform them into new persons united in a new community. They are now brothers and sisters united in and through Jesus Christ. The response is positive, very positive. 
Barnabas realizes the congregation will need additional help. Apparently, without consulting Jerusalem, Barnabas does what needs to be done. He needs a teaching pastor. And so he calls Vanderbloom and church staffing and asks them to send a teaching pastor. <laughs> Actually, he goes to Tarsus, tracks down a recent acquaintance named Saul, who we probably better know from his Roman name, Paul. Barnabas invites Paul to join him in Antioch and to share in the work that God was doing among the Gentiles in this place. Antioch is a success story. At least, it appears to be. Barnabas is a hero. At least, he appears to be. Barnabas and Paul are great co-workers. At least, they appear to be. If we continue reading Acts and read on into Paul's letters, we will discover that in a short time, troublemakers will arrive on the scene. Troublemakers will come into this newly formed congregation. They interfere with the work that God was doing in this place. Peter visits Antioch. He eats with people from Gentile with Gentile heritage, but he withdraws from them after the arrival of these troublemakers. The troublemakers even influence Barnabas to waver in his commitment to live across the boundary, disappointing Paul. Clearly the result of what was happening in Antioch was messy but it was a necessary messy. It was a good messy. It was a God-ordained messy. As we cross our social and political boundary, cultural, social, and political boundaries, we should not expect the immediate joining of hands and singing of we are one in the spirit. It will be messy. It will be hard. It will be good. It will glorify God. But how do we move from broken to beautiful in our relationships with people on the other side of the cultural, social, and political boundary? I don't have a three-step, four-step, five-step method for crossing the boundary. I don't know if I am even the best person to address the message of Acts 11, 19 through 26. I am not the poster boy for crossing the cultural, social, and political boundary. I am an introvert, and I am comfortable as an introvert. Social distancing was a great invention. <laughs> Certainly, I interact with students. And in interacting with students, I cross this boundary every day. I encounter students from various ethnicities, economic classes, countries, and political ideology. However, I engage these students online. It's really easy to cross this boundary online. It's another thing to cross this boundary face to face. I don't have much opportunity to cross this boundary in face to face environments. I suspect the lack of opportunity might be due to laziness more than unavoidable circumstances. 
the message of our text has prompted me to think again how I might live on the other side of the cultural, social, and political boundary. Crossing the cultural, social, and political boundary to do the mission Jesus entrusted to us is not easy. We will encounter criticism. We will be inconsistent. We will miss opportunities because we hesitate, because we fear. What matters, though, is that we are available, that we act, that when we fail, we repent, get up, and cross the boundary. We are thinking these days about vision. And as we do, we are reflecting on the theme from broken to beautiful. A piece of art, one that I helped to create, comes to mind as I think of this theme from broken to beautiful. In 1964, the students at Madison Elementary in St. Cloud, beautiful St. Cloud, Minnesota, created this mural, or helped to create, this mural to honor the retiring principal, Miss Mary McNevin. Students, I, I still remember, bringing colored glass to school, which somebody then broke into small pieces and somebody else assembled in this mural. It's big. Um, that still hangs on the wall in the hallway next to the office in um, St. Cloud in Madison Elementary. And ha Holly uh, Lesnow, who I think thank for taking these photos. She's an administrative assistant at the school. Um, I thank her for the effort that she put forth to answer my request. But here we see an example, and maybe I'm stretching your concept of beauty here, but here we see an example of how brokenness can be br put together to create something beautiful. Last Sunday, Andrew invited us to think about and pray for a particular person or group of people from whom we are separated. He asked us to pray for the person or group and ourselves that we might be open to God changing our lives and our relationships so we might live and work as one. This morning we have an opportunity to anonymously share who we are praying for so we might pray for one another in our pursuit of unity. As we leave the sanctuary this morning, we will see a board in the lobby on which we can post the name of the person or identify the person or group or relationship for which we are praying. We can then pray with one another as we work together for unity. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your goodness to us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for your ongoing work in our lives to transform us into the people you want us to be. And now we ask that you would extend your transformation to our relationships with each other and with persons outside this congregation, throughout the community, regardless of cultural, societal, or political differences. Help us to reach across the boundary so that we might be your witnesses to all nations here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
you stand for our closing song.